crippled black phoenix <laughs> but can he still rise um he's rising all the time <laughs> i hope <laughs> yeah just try not to mess everything up <laughs> Just kidding a bit. Uh, have you heard about Austria winning the Eurovision Song Contest? Is that who won? Yeah. Oh, we were asking uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, me and Daniel, we were, we were trying to find out who actually won the won the Eurovision, <laughs> and nobody knew. So that's good to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Austria, and and the song was called "Rise Like a Phoenix." Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> okay, oh, that's <was> cool. <laughs> I'm very glad. <laughs> You're known for, uh, let's say, end time ballads, but you can't always be like, fuck, it's the end of the world shit, you know? You have to laugh sometimes, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, yeah, I don't know how much people get, but it's it, there's always loads of dark humor in, you know, everything that we do, you know, the imagery and the albums and, the, you know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of serious things in there, but it's never without the, the humor or the hope. And, you know, I guess what the new album is, is more, a little bit more about the hope. But there's al always the black humor there. You know, whether people get it or not, it's there. <laughs> and <laughs> I think sometimes I, I just do it to amuse myself. <laughs> well, but it has to be there. Or if, yeah. if there's no hope, so well, you can't, why do anything? Yeah, you can't appreciate one without the other. Yeah. You know? So, and I think in the, in the worst times comes the, the, the best humor and comes the strongest art as well. So. Gee, shit. <laughs> Man, you got to read stuff from you know where they were in in Auschwitz. Yeah, yeah. Jokes they've they've written back then. That's yeah, right. that's incredible. Yeah. Man. If if you realize the situation they were in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, but it's a, it's a great approach. It's great therapy, as is music. You know. Yeah. So um, and I mean, you find there's a lot of emergency services that have a real sick sense of humor. You know, ambulance guys and you know mm -hmm. firemen. You know, and and you hear those people, you know, talking about their jobs, and you think, what? You know, <laughs> but yeah, that's how they do. You know, that is pe how people deal with things. You know, and yeah. if you take yourself too seriously, you tie yourself up in all kinds of horrible knots. <laughs> You've been to China. Just reflect a bit of what was like the most amazing thing there for you. Um, yeah, well, it was a real culture shock for a start. Um, The most amazing thing was that realizing that you know mo the most most of the people that we met over there have the same ideals you know and and they think pretty much the same you know but they're stuck in a country that's got one foot in communism and one foot in um, uh, capitalism mm. um, they're kind of making it up as they go along you know um, and it's amazing what you find out you know um, as as well as that you know. A lot of the ex-Soviet countries and the, the you know the the, um, the Balkan states and everything, mm -hmm. um, it's it's meeting the people. That's the most amazing thing, you know, and finding people there's a, who really think the same, um, and it's a, it's a real kind of eye opener, really, mm -hmm. um, and it it's really close to my heart that kind of thing, you know, because. I feel that in a lot of places, people have been very complacent and accepted change that's not been for the best. Um, they've lost the ability to kind of change anything for the better, you know. Uh, and then when you when you talk to people, you know, you actually find out the details and you find out reasons why. So the whole thing in China, you know, they were um, it was very interesting to to see their perspective on it, you know. Um, so that and the fact that uh, they, they were going to check our lyrics to see if they were going to say anything about Tibet. <laughs> so, Was there a situation where they told you, hey, we've read your lyrics, that's nah, uh, cut we this song told, up? Yeah, we were told that we would get the lyrics checked. Um, whether they didn't did or not, I, I don't actually know. They didn't come to us to check the lyrics. They might have investigated us somewhat. But uh, I think it was, yeah, I think we can blame Bjork for that one because I think she, she went and played in China. And, you know, my heart off to her. She, you know, she, she spouted a lot of things about Tibet. And you can say a lot in China that you probably not expect you can mm. say, but you can't say anything about mm. that, which, you know, it's... Um, which I think you should be able to, but uh, that was the only thing we were, we were told, right. you know, really don't because it would be a lot of trouble. So. I remember for metal bands that went there, uh, they they used to send ABBA lyrics. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty safe bet. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, if they did read the lyrics, I don't know what the, if they even understand any of it, you know. <laughs> but it's some of it's pretty subliminal. But um, no, it's it, it's it's difficult, you know. Where, when you're told, you know, you can't say anything, you know, even if you believe strongly in it. Um, and some people would probably argue against going to play in those kind of countries, like it was in South Africa with apartheid. Mm. Um, but then I believe that you should be able to go. It's like with sport. You shouldn't not go somewhere for the because of their government, yeah. you know. Because the majority of people, you know, they, they might think differently and they deserve to have entertainment, you know. Mm. Um, and it's not, you know, a lot of the time, it, it's not their fault. So, you know, you, you should do that. It's like taking certain symbolisms back, you know, from being misused. You know, <laughs> and we all know the, the the famous ones, you know. But um, you know, you should take them back. You should you should you should make a stand. You should put your foot down. You know. Yeah. So uh, I think yeah, you know, travel to those countries because it, you can't not go somewhere because of because of the powers. You know, yeah. if if there's people there and they want to see a concert, then they should get a concert. They should. They deserve it. Yeah, like, exactly. Like anywhere else. Yeah. Exactly. You quite fell in love with Poznan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it wasn't well, always that way, right? No, no, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a long story that one, but yeah, it's just it's just a personal journey that you know I had. You know, it's all to do with like an old band of mine, you know, mm -hmm. and we we're having a particularly tough tour, and mm -hmm. our singer he he eventually died from kidney disease, but that's when it, it took hold, and his kidneys failed on tour, and he had to fly home, and we was without a singer, and we was having to play because we wouldn't get paid otherwise. And we couldn't afford to fly him home, and uh, it was really crazy. Anyway, that was, and then we were traveling back from Russia, and we were going through Poland, um, and we just happened to stop in Poznan for a night uh, for the bus driver to have his break. Um, and during that night, there was an altercation with one of the American guys on the tour with us, and the police in the bar, and, and the, he got arrested for uh, drunken behavior. And it was all a bit of a setup, you know, and they just demanded money off us. And then they took the money and then said, no, he's still not coming out of jail. He got beat on by, you know, all the Polish drunks that bit his bag, tried to take his wedding ring. And, oh, shit. and then, yeah, uh, it was just really, really, really crazy, you know, and quite dark time. And so for, for many years, that's my memory of Poznan, you know, and I always associate Poznan with the, you know, It was really corrupt and kind of dodgy and really bad things happened there. Mm. And I mean, that was in the mid 90s when it was yeah. a little bit Wild West, you know. Yeah. Um, and then with Cripple Black Phoenix, we got uh, the just so happened a show got booked in Poznan. And it was like, wow, you know, I'm going back to Poznan, you know, crazy. But then it turned out, you know, the promoters were great. The people were great. The show was great. We met with some really good friends and we kept going back and we just created a really strong bond there so it was quite cathartic you know so yeah there's a bit of history a bit of personal history and then it's just the, the the connection the strong connection that we have with the, some friends there and the you know and the fans there and that's where the whole thing came about you know that's why there's a song and then we didn't plan to make a live album there they just recorded the show and it turned out nice you know <laughs> it was like you know and then uh, you know right. my friend todd from america was like i want to put something out for vinyl day you know mm -hmm. and he put put it out on vinyl and it just yeah spiraled from there <laughs> see it's something um uh that that people say of you that that you really focus on you know bringing the real thing live mm -hmm. you know is that why you often say that you really love uh, Rammstein? <laughs> um, well, I mean, if you're referring to like what we actually do live, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's no no secret that, yeah. you know. Actually, it was my mum who got me into Rammstein. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my mum and dad, my dad had a record shop for many years mm -hmm. and and, and um, I was in there one day and my mum was just playing Rammstein. She really got into that the album, um, you know, Mutter. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's just playing it over and over, you know. The, she even went to see them live. I haven't seen them live, right? <laughs> and I'm so jealous. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, um, I just have so much respect for a band like that because I think for many years they, they weren't making any money. They were just putting everything into the live show, yeah. you know, and they really cared about 
the people turn up to see them and they pay money and they put on the best show and the biggest show and their humor as well you know they don't take themselves seriously <laughs> but they have um quite an edge to them as well mm. and they can get really um good messages mm. you know or strong messages across yeah. where it's wrapped up in its self-aware kind of humor you know and and the live show is something you know i'd love to experience it one day but you know um so I have a lot of respect you, you for them. You have to. It's, I mean, it's they, really they, an they, awesome show. They really, their work ethic is amazing as well, you yeah. know. Um, and they uh, they don't, I, I haven't seen anything where they really kind of act like rock stars, you know. I think they appreciate where they are because they've worked at it. Yeah. So, and, and I hope in, in some small way that people can understand that Cripple Black Phoenix are not rock stars and never will be, you know. Um, mm. It's you know I I wouldn't ever want to be like that you know I think I think you've got to accept the fact that it's just us guys you know playing and and performing for people you know and you know it's a couple of us somewhat reluctantly because we're not comfortable on stage but you know it's all we can do because I don't know how to do anything else yeah <laughs> the Gibbon dream Gibbon dream yeah <laughs> do, do you know. A gibbon in a dream represents someone of little intelligence who leads himself to a serious nerve breakdown. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go with that. Go with that. <laughs> Now, what's it about? Um, so you've seen the, the posts about um, fi fictional song titles in the set. Yeah. <laughs> um, Uh, I do. I just, seriously, they they just <laughs> pop in my mind. Really, you really? Know? yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that's the that's the silly northern black humor that, that I have. You would go with that definition. I would definitely go with that definition. <laughs> yeah, and it, I, I would. I hope more people would get the definitions <laughs> from those song titles. And I kind of hope that some people actually think they're they're actually real songs as well. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, that, that's uh, yeah, that's um, I don't really know how to explain. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. You did soundtracks, uh, The Devil's Business. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, listen to your music. Um, it's kind of really works good for for a movie soundtrack, right? I mean, that that must be, must be an easy job for you. I always, I wouldn't call it easy. Yeah, uh, I've always been told that the, the music you know, on the CBP albums uh, it can be cinematic, um, and then I, I kind of fell into that because I, I mean, I've, I'm more influenced influenced by uh, films than I am music anyway. In fact, my biggest influence is real life, but it, more than music, it's film. Um, and then the, a good friend of mine, he's become a good friend of mine. He, I first met him and he approached me and said, I'm doing a, a short film, which was uh, Little Deaths. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to use a CBP song for it. I was just like, oh, great, you know, brilliant. Thanks for asking, you know. <laughs> And then he was like, okay, I'm doing this other film, you know, can we use some more music? And I said, okay, well, if, if you really want something, you know, I said, how about I just do something for you, you know? And he was just like, oh, okay, they're brilliant, you know? <laughs> I said, well, I'll give it a try. And uh, so I did, and there, were, there wasn't a studio recording or anything, you know, they're like kind of demos, you know? Hmm. And he was like, no, this is really, really cool. And it ended up, I, I did the soundtrack for that film. Hmm. And now we're working on more things as well, you know, and he's working on a film with a proper film budget now. So that's going to be interesting. So I think the next thing, it's called No Man's Land, which is set in the First World War in the trenches and, you know, the, the, the digging the tunnels and, and they ex expose a bunch of ghouls, which are not strictly, they're kind of the undead, but they're not like, so, you know, they, they feast on corpses and of course there's a lot of corpses in, in the trenches. And so anyway, it's, it's that kind of theme, you know, um, And that's going to be great. I'm really, really into that, you know. And that um, sounds awesome. Man. Yeah, wow. I'm super interested in in history, especially war history, mm. and uh, and I, and I love my horror films. So <laughs> I mean, what can I say? It's like best of both worlds. <laughs> so I'm really going to get my teeth into that, you know. But I'm I'm happy doing soundtracks because you you can make music that's anonymous. What would be a director you you would die to have him have him call you? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, I hope I, I'd have liked George Miller to give me a call for the new Mad Max film. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, Francis Ford Coppola, you know, that would be a good one. Um, 
Uh, How about Rob Zombie? Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, I, I could I could work with Rob Zombie. You know, he's pretty. I'd have to get like my my, my trashy head on. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, people like that are great because you know they they, they like to push things as well. You know, um, and uh, don't necessarily care if people understand it or not. You know, uh, and it's very. I mean, he's quite stylized. You know, and whatever he puts his hand to, you, you kind of know it's him. So um, that would be good, and that would be a challenge because I mean, obviously, I mean, I love the first White Zombie album as well, you know. <laughs> so That's a classic. It is, yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of, <coughs> kind of lost him a bit on the way, you know. But um, yeah, the, so he's obviously he's, he's, he knows what he's doing. I mean. yeah. <laughs> Hello, this is Mullerchak, and I'm from Cripple Black Phoenix, and Justin is the only TV you need. <laughs> How about that? That's good. I, <laughs> I'd buy that. <laughs> Mullerchak.